Until relatively recently, if I spoke about someone walking with a staff, everyone would have had a reasonable idea of what I was talking about, what the staff was for, and why one would carry a staff. Looking at our present generation though, I wonder if anyone still understands the significance of a staff. In biblical times, a staff was an essential part of one's equipment. It served as protection from wild animals and a makeshift weapon in case of being attacked, particularly employed in defense. It was a way of protecting and herding your flock of sheep or goats, and it was also a sign of authority. This tradition and imagery had been transferred to the royal scepter long ago already. Today I want to tell you of a man who had a very special and particular relationship with his staff though. This man was called Jacob. From Jacob's prayer to God for protection from his brother Esau in Genesis 32 verse 10, we know that Jacob walked with a staff, a habit he had likely picked up while looking after the flocks of his father-in-law Laban. Either way, in Genesis 32 verse 22 to 30, we read the account of Jacob wrestling with God. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants and his eleven sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream along with all his possessions. So Jacob was left all alone, and there a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower Jacob, he struck the socket of Jacob's hip and dislocated it as they wrestled. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. Jacob, he replied. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. And Jacob requested, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed Jacob there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, saying, Indeed I have seen God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Now, can you imagine Jacob limping for the rest of his life because God struck me on the hip? that staff certainly took on a new meaning for him at that point. Because from this time, he would be heavily leaning on it just to get along. I imagine he was much like most of us, and in the face of adversity and seemingly meaningless struggle, would cry out to God, Why God? Why this? Why me? And it is easy to look at people in such situations and give them the usual platitudes. Why not you? It's just what life is. God is testing you. Or some of the more accurate ones. All things work together for the good of those who love God. You simply don't have God's perspective. And if you could see it from His point of view, you'd understand. Why do I say that the last two are more accurate? Because they are true and can help us accept the difficult circumstances and even thank God amidst them for and for those difficult circumstances. Can you see what I'm driving at yet? Well, Jacob was a self-made man who had wrestled his way to success against other men all his life. In a way, this event is like a second birth. In his mother's womb, he was wrestling with his brother Esau inside of her. But Esau was born first. But not without Jacob holding on to his heel earning him the name Heel Catcher, Jacob, which was a contemporary expression or way of referring to someone as a supplanter, a deceiver who takes the place of another by deception. He of course lives up to this name in his struggles with Esau and obtaining the right of the firstborn, as well as with his, his father-in-law Laban in getting Rachel as his wife, and the rewards of his efforts in shepherding his stepfather's herd. Here he struggles with God before his rebirth, and again refuses to let go of the stronger party. When God asks him his name, he doesn't do so because he doesn't know it. He is asking him 
so that Jacob is reminded of who he is and where he has come from. And then he renames him Israel or Yitzrael. He who contends or struggles with God. So, though he contends with men and God and prevailed, Jacob limps from that place with a new humility and sense of awe. He gradually learns that he will have to lean on that rugged wooden staff quite heavily for the rest of his life, or he will not be able to move around much. Of course, the staff refers to the scepter and authority of God, and it also points to the cross and our reliance on God's redemptive salvation rather than our own strength and efforts. It's easy to see from our vantage point and perspective how this might have been to the advantage of Jacob in his overall walk with God. But I'm also pretty sure that he must have asked God to heal him many, many times. And then in those times, he missed the very real advantage he received due to God's blessing after wrestling with him through the night. Not to mention the fact that he saw the face of God and lived. But every time he thought about a place called Peniel, Panav Elohim, in the face of God, where he met God that night, he would remember the promises. And every time his leg hurt, it was a reminder of that night at Peniel. Perhaps we can get to a place where we trust God so much that we look past the immediate circumstances and simply praise Him for knowing better and doing in our lives what is best for us, even if it seems to be exactly the opposite. Personally, I have come to realize that when I look back, even the worst moments of my life were the times when God was not only carrying me, but was allowing me to walk through a field of thorns. And that this was what was the best thing that could happen to me for my own formation and welfare. So I praise God for hardships. That is, when I take a moment to stop complaining and tell God that I trust Him. But I also object to people mindlessly wishing me God's favor, blessings and prosperity. I usually tell them that I prefer it when God disciplines me as a son. Because feeling his rod of correction assures me that he has not given up on me as yet. So, for today, I wish you no more than knowing God and being known by him. Hearing his voice and understanding that he loves you beyond the circumstances or your ability to compre comprehend them. Shalom.